Welcome to the Brett Johnson Biz podcast, where we discuss business on purpose, radically fresh leadership, capital that transforms society, and marketplace stories that embolden difference makers. Welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. When should you forget about your past? Forgive and forget. And when should you remember and why? When does remembering hold you back? You've often heard the statement, don't let your past define your future. And when should you be smart to remember? What are the circumstances? I want to discuss a paradox and I think it's really, really important for the time that we're in. Why? Because many people have been through trying times, times that have been difficult, times where they have had delays, where they have expected certain things from God and they haven't happened yet, where certain things that they hoped for and prayed for, that they believed for, have not yet come to pass. Does this make you bitter? Does it make you better? What happens with the gap that exists between the promises you've heard from God and the practicalities of what you see today? Let's be honest. For most of us, the things that we've dreamed of, that we've hoped for, have not yet come to pass. If we have any ounce of vision, very few people say, yep, everything on my bucket list is done. Everything is taken care of. Very few people have that situation. Most of us have dreams that are bigger than our past accomplishments. So how do we deal with this? I'd like to talk about three aspects. Firstly, I'll go to a story in the New Testament. There's an interesting story with the real estate guys. You might remember Ananias and Sapphira. Now what had happened in the early church was that people were getting along famously. Nobody thought that the property that they had was their own, but it was for the benefit of the common good. And so it was quite regular practice for people to sell a piece of excess land, for example, or sell property and put it into a common fund and distribute it to people who had need. Well, some people who got in on this was Ananias and Sapphira, and we can expect that there was some sort of recognition that, yes, these people have given it all, have been generous, except that they didn't give it all. What did they do? Well, they said they gave it all. They sold a piece of land. They said that they gave it all to the apostles, and they didn't. And the husband came in, and he gave the story. And Peter at the time says, look, you know, the land before you sold it was yours. After you sold it, the profit or the money was yours. I guess they didn't have capital gains tax back then, but the money was yours. So why did you lie to the Holy Spirit, to God, and say that you'd given all when you didn't? And the guy dropped dead. His wife came in. It was the same story. I'm not going to get into the subtleties of that situation except to say there was a premise of two things. It's a bi-directional view on things or a bifurcated view might be a better way to say it. As far as Ananias and Sapphira were concerned, the property was theirs. Between them and God, it was God's. Between them and the community, it was theirs. So as far as the apostles and these uh, disciples were concerned, What was theirs was theirs. It didn't belong to the community. It wasn't a communistic, socialistic community of property in some sort of forced religious way. No, it was their property. It was their money. That was very, very clear. Between them and God, however, God says the land is mine. Everything is mine. You're mine. Everything he has is mine. So there is this bifurcated view, if you like, or this bifold view of things. What does that have to do with us today? Well, many of us have been hurt, had disappointments. Maybe we had business deals that went bad. Clients didn't pay us or business partners ripped us off. Employees maybe took more than they should have or promised to do something and didn't do it. Maybe you worked with a customer and you were going to do a joint venture and you gave them a product idea and they took your product 
and you couldn't fight them because they were much bigger than you so they stole your intellectual property there's any number of things that have happened in the past and generally one's stance is healthier when you say forget it let's forgive and forget and move on I'm not gonna let that hold me back they are not my source they are not my provision and ultimately God is a righteous judge and he will deal with us he will take care of this in his time so that's one view is to forgive to forget to move on because otherwise if we don't do this it's very easy to fall in this in-between space which is the blame game and offense which means that whenever something doesn't go well with us let's just say we don't get the promotion we want we don't get hired the way we should have and we look for somebody to blame that is a cancerous thing in one's mind when you begin to build a glass house of blame where when something goes wrong one looks for something to blame or someone to blame it really is bad because it'll poison your relationship with organizations with leaders with other people if you're part of a faith community with a church part of a club part of a business it'll poison your relationship poison your relationship if you get into the habit of assigning blame when something goes wrong ultimately if you can't find someone to blame and you are playing the blame game who are you going to blame well the obvious target is God if God is good why did that war happen if God is good why did that child die if God is good why was there this health crisis if God was is good how come the stock exchange dropped if we get into the pattern of assigning blame we open ourselves up to the disease of offense and we will get offended now things will go wrong in life there is no question we suffer the godly as much as the ungodly the rain falls on the good and the not so good there's a lot of things that happen in life that happen as a matter of course and some of them are not going to be good and so consequently things will go wrong and if we're in the habit of blaming we will end up being offended and nowadays we have laws that build cultural sensitivities that shouldn't be there it simply heightens the likelihood that people will live with an offense and when you live with an offense it's hard to be a productive positive happy person so nowadays we have offenses about all sorts of things I won't go into them but just think about it and how we've even made a law out of these things saying you're not allowed to offend anybody and if you do you are guilty whether you've actually done anything that's wrong or not so there are times to forgive and forget for sure that should be our de default we should avoid blame and offense but is there a time to remember the things that have gone wrong and why would you do that well let me take you to Psalm 62 verse 11 in it the psalmist says one thing God has spoken two things I have heard this is pretty interesting this is unusual mathematics God says one thing the psalmist hears two things and what were the two things that the psalmist heard goes on to say what I've heard is that you, O Lord, are good and you are strong. You are kind, you are powerful. I've heard, I hear with my ears, I perceive, I watch the ways of God and I figured out he's good and he's strong. He's kind and he's powerful. So what is the one thing that the psalmist heard? And you have to go back to the beginning of the psalm psalm 62 verses 1 and 2 where it talks about god being um, one's protector one's fortress one's strong tower and then it has this phrase i will not be shaken why because my identity is in god because my identity is in god and because i've heard i will not be shaken 
I can conclude God is good and God is strong. He's strong, that'll stop me being shaken. He's good, that's his intent towards me. So what does that have to do with today? Well, of late, I've been feeling something which is a little unusual. Normally, I'm in the forget and forgive mode on things. But recently, I felt that God has been nudging me to remember. To remember those, not so much the people, but the amounts of money, of resources, that have been taken away from me or from my wife, my family, unjustly. Sometimes it's a theft. Sometimes it's a misappropriation of property, including intellectual property. And sometimes it's a failure to do good towards me when God prompted them or told them to do good. They had an opportunity to do it and they didn't do it. Now, I have no interest in being bitter. I have no interest in being unforgiving. I have to release the people to God. And yet I found that God has been prompting me and you have to be careful with this so that you don't get into offense and bitterness and blame. But God has been prompting me to remember why it's because we're in a season, as my friend Francois Stein says, of reward. We're in a season where God is providing recompense for the things that went wrong. Now, I have not lived the story of Job in the Old Testament. I do not have boils all over my body. I have not lost my wife and children. I have not lost all of my finances. But there is a principle there. And there is a principle that God rewards. Now, not all rewards will be in this life. But what I find in this particular season, and it is perhaps just a season, that God wants us to remember so that we have a stance, not the stance between me and other people, but the stance between me and the principalities and powers, the stance between me and the heavenly realm, where I say, I was scammed for this amount of money. And the Bible says, pay back sevenfold. I was taken for this amount of money. And the Bible says, pay back double. I was taken for this amount of money and the Bible says pay it back with interest. And so this is not me getting mad and angry at the people who took advantage of me or didn't do what they should have done. It's me making a stand in the spirit on behalf of myself, my household, my family, my extended household and saying, ah, that was taken, that was lost. And I am expecting, because God is good, He is just, He is powerful, I'm expecting that there will be a return and a reward. I'm viewing what went wrong in the past as sowing. And I'm expecting reaping. The scripture says in one of the Psalms that those who sow in tears, in fact, one of the translations says, and this is one of my wife's favorite verses, those who go out sowing sorrow seeds will reap a harvest. And for many of us, there have been years and years of sowing sorrow seeds, of sowing in famine, of giving when there wasn't much from which to give. And yet we are now perhaps in a season of reward. And we are always serving a God who does reward. Now, you might say, Brett, this sounds like name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. No. Hebrews says that those who believe must believe that God is. So God exists. So we believe God is. And we must believe that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Is it good enough to, to believe that God is? The devil believes that God is, but he doesn't believe that he's good. And he doesn't believe that he rewards positively. The parable of the talents, the unprofitable servant, the one who had to go straight to jail, don't collect $200, that one, 
didn't believe that God was good. I know that you're a strict master, was a response. It's a bad view of God. We have to have, have a view that says, I know that you are the rewarder of those that diligently seek you. I know that your recompense, your repayment, your restitution, your restoring of me and my fortunes is actually in your hands. That's what I believe. And so I think we're in a season where it's okay to carefully, without getting into blame and without getting into unforgiveness, where we can say, yes, that happened for this amount of money and I'm expecting a reward. I'm standing in faith, not that God owes me, but that I believe in the goodness, the power, the sovereignty of God to return with a repayment. Again, I'll say there are some who will only receive their reward in the afterlife, in eternity. And that is fine. That's 100%. And yet there are times when God says to us, for this, for today, I want you to stand and to expect a repayment. Now, years ago, it was about 2016, I wrote a little book, 10 Steps to Restoration. And it's a small book, you can get it on Amazon. And it talks about a sequence in which God restores things. And it was instructive to me because it didn't start with God restoring some of the things I would have thought would have been first on the list. So I went through and just taking from the book of Isaiah, found a series of 10 steps that were there in a process of restoration. Perhaps you want to take a look at that. Aside from looking at the book, I would encourage you, and I will place a link to that book in the show notes below. But what I want to encourage you to do is to actually ask yourself, is God asking you to remember so that you can believe for a reward? Why is this important? Let me close with this. Years ago, I recognized that people of faith have a particular risk. And the risk is this. You believe that God can do certain things. So you believe that there's an upward tra trajectory in life, if you like, where you're hoping for things to get better and better. And at a broad scale, you believe that that's the way it's going to be. The reality is, is that the actual experience, this is a little bit like a you know, you expect the stock price to go like this or the market to go like that. But what happens is every day it jumps up and down. So the, there's a gap between our expectation and our experience on a day to day basis. And that gap is either a disappointment gap or a faith gap. Either we look at that gap and we say, yes, I know God is good. And my experience today is not reconciled to the way that I expect it to be, but I still am standing in faith because I believe God is good. And you close the gap between the smooth upward chart and the jaggedy chart of everyday circumstances. You close that gap with a firm belief in God. That gap can also be the disillusionment, disappointment gap. And we can fill that gap with a seeping, creeping bitterness towards God and others because things didn't pan out the way we expected them to pan out. Now, for younger people, that's anybody younger than me, I guess, you might say, ah, well, my whole life is ahead of me. When you become a speeder, and you're over 65 miles an hour or over 65, uh, there is a danger that more stuff has gone wrong than has gone right in your life. And so it's very easy for people to get into a slump and to think, well, I'm going to stop believing for good things. But what I encourage you to do is to watch out for that danger and to stay sharp. I remember teaching a convergence class, and I'll end with this story. It was in uh, California in the mid-peninsula, and I was at a church, Peninsula Covenant Church, and the convergence class had a group of people in it, including 
an 80 year old doctor and he said I've been in this church 49 years I've held just about every job in the church but I just believe some God has something more for my life and I loved that attitude at 80 years old he was saying I believe God has something more for my life don't let age make you disillusioned don't waste the latter decades of your life because you've fallen into the unforgiveness, blame, despondency trap. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O Lord, are good and you, O Lord, are strong. Therefore, I will not be shaken. As we head into tumultuous times, which I think we are heading into, I would encourage you, avoid the trap of simply forgetting and not learning lessons. Avoid the trap of being bound by the past. Avoid the trap of blame and offense. And if you do remember what's gone wrong, remember with an eye of faith because you expect that He is and that He is the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Have a great week and I'll see you on the next podcast.